Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney, and this is Caffeinated Crimes. Courtney, have you ever thought about... So, before we started recording this, I was just, like, laying in bed chilling, and I was like, wouldn't it be nice if I could just, like, record this podcast from bed? And Andrew's like, I mean, you technically could. I was like... There is I a mean, podcast I mean, that does that. Oh. It's, um, I'm sure it, I, Nick I Offerman and his wife. I did know that. And they, like, guests that. come in, and they get to, like, lay in the bed with them. I did know that. But I also mean just like laying in bed, you know? And so Andrew's like, well, you could get like one of those long like mic stands and just like hook it up mm-hmm. to the headboard and just like have it directly in front of you. And I was like, but I run out of breath just talking in general, like sitting up with like my diaphragm in the right position. Yeah. I can only imagine what it would sound like if I told an entire story laying down. <laughs> like, if I'm being honest, I'd probably fall asleep. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm going to take a nap. I'm just getting all cozy and yeah. But, you know, like when you have a sleepover, like you'll lay there Mm -hmm. and like talk forever and everything. But I don't know. It's kind of different telling a murder story that has to be a little bit coherent, you know? Yeah. I feel like podcasts that maybe do like laying down or in like more casual settings aren't talking about such serious things. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And don't have such like dense like. Mm hmm. I don't want to say script because like they don't have like a script per se, but you know what I mean. Like it's yeah, not as flowy as a, a bed podcast should be. I feel yeah, like. yeah, because I never want to be that podcast that like starts taking what we do lightly. And, you yes. know, like definitely, like obviously the before and after banter or whatever. But you know, mm-hmm. like once it comes down to like the meat of it, yeah. like I don't want to be a podcast. It's like oh, we're gonna lay in bed. Yeah. So here's what we do. So we lay in bed, we record the intro, we move to our desks, we do our official, and then we go back to bed and chat. <laughs> or what we could do is we could record our intro and our outro in bed and then, you know. I was thinking that too. We like, could okay, just like, like batch week, record just... this part and yeah. then batch record the front and the end. See? There we go. There we go. That's that's a new podcast, guys. That's what we're going to do. Not really, but... <laughs> so when our uh, intro and outro start sounding a little a little weird, um, yeah, Courtney and I are just going to be laying in bed. You know? Well, you know, we did We do record, have a podcast like that. Yeah, our Patreon from CrimeCon last year and probably also our CrimeCon from this year will be recorded yeah. from bed. <laughs> so Yeah, probably. <laughs> Which I was already thinking, like, how excited I am because... Last year, we were robbed of our Thursday night chill mm, before we, like, yes. get into it. And I'm like, oh, this time, like, we can, like, not be stressed in an airport about yes. when is our flight going to get in and getting in at, like, midnight. Yeah. You know? And then like, having to be like, there at, like, I'm, first thing in the morning, like, ready to go. Maybe we can actually enjoy, like, the pool on Thursday <laughs> yes. and not be fantasizing <laughs> about it for the entire weekend. But yeah. I was thinking, like, how excited I am that we actually get to have, like, Thursday night. <laughs> yes. I got a little bit of relaxed time ahead of time. It's just like ease into the weekend. Yeah. yeah. Same. Because it felt very hit the ground running because of how yeah. late our flight was. So, And it's hard yeah. too because like it goes all day long, which of course you don't have to go to everything, but like you're paying good money to be there. You want mm-hmm. to go to everything. And then it's always like the sessions that you like most want to go to. Like there's never a point where you're like, okay, well like, I mean, we had a few of those. And so we took some breaks, but you know, you don't have a ton where it's like, oh, well, I don't care about any of these. Like I'll just go. Yeah you know, do whatever. And especially what's in the middle of the day. So you're like, okay, I have like an hour and a half. Am I going to get on my bathing suit and get to the pool, relax, and then have to get right back into the mental space of, you know, yeah, where we're at and what we're doing. And so, yeah, I'm very excited about that Thursday evening as well. Yeah. It'll be very nice. It'll be very nice. So, yeah, that's, we didn't really have a whole lot to, you know, jump into um but we do have two updates and then we will get into today's episode and i guess i will go first since i speak first so then <laughs> we didn't really discuss that's this ahead of time, but... that's what i was waiting on because that's what we normally do but... yeah i'm just i'm just sitting here chilling you know i don't know my brain is still in bed <laughs> um so this update my sister-in-law actually told me about today and i as i'm reading into a little bit more it sounds familiar but i can't be 100 percent sure because Unfortunately, there are so many like similar to this case, Um, but there was a pretty big update in the case of Suzanne Morphew. So she went missing in 2020 in Colorado after a bike ride. 
and her husband was arrested for her murder in 2021, but then charges were dropped in 2022. And I can't find a whole lot of, like, detailed information about either one of those, like why he was arrested, why the charges were dropped. Um, but her body was found last year. And then today, um, April 29th, as of this recording, the results of her autopsy were released, which showed that the manner of death was homicide. Um, and there were three drugs found in her body. I'm going to butcher these. Um, Buterphenol, azaparone, and metatomidinine um which are like like wildlife tranquilizer mm -hmm. type drugs um and it did say that do there we was know no... what her husband did for a living he's not like a wildlife vet is he <laughs> unless those are easily accessible drugs to everyone i don't know apparently the azaparone is a tranquilizer used mainly for pigs and elephants um meta Tomadine is a sedative and pain reliever for veterinary procedures for animals, specifically dogs. And butyrophenol is a synthetic opioid pain reliever, um, often used as a nasal spray treatment for migraine headaches. So the combination of those three. Let's see. Just because, you know, I'm all I'm thinking is somebody had to have access. These are not drugs I feel like most people could access, especially if it's like for pigs and elephants and dog yeah. surgeries like seems like something it's reminded me a little bit of last week's episode with the dentist and him being able mm -hmm. to order yeah definitely things. he had a landscaping business well i mean he was released so i would assume they have a, maybe hopefully some evidence yeah that maybe proves he didn't but or just Very didn't have enough evidence to prove yeah. that he did. True. But now with the results of the autopsy, I mean, more could come from mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure at the time her body was found, like, I mean, that it had been two years at that point. So I don't know what, three years at that point, um, by the math. Um, I don't know what the state of her body was at that point. So like, this could be the first time that her family is actually getting an answer as to like, mm -hmm. was it an accident or a homicide? Because... Which like, an entire year? My God. Anyway, um, maybe it's just not been released. Maybe they knew prior to today. Um, but especially because she went missing like during a bike ride in Colorado. So it's like there could be like many situations of an accidental mm -hmm. death, you know, in that type of scenario. So for them to have to wait so long and then find out like, okay, like she is definitely dead. And then you have to keep waiting. And then you find out, oh, it is definitely a homicide. Like, so many layers of like grief that the family's having to go through. Mm -hmm. And then our other update. Is Speaking that, of layers of grief, I mean. Yeah, I was literally thinking that. I'm like, well, pretty good transition yeah. there. Um, Harvey Weinstein's conviction was overturned. Um, so the overturning of the conviction comes after his lawyer claimed that uh, Harvey Weinstein didn't receive a fair trial due to decisions of trial judge James Burke, in particular, allowing three women to testify against him whose allegations weren't included in the case and permitting prosecutors to potentially confront him about his general behavior. So saying, I guess, these three women who testified didn't like specifically pertain to the case mm -hmm. at hand. Um so his lawyer is kind of saying like, oh, it meant more so his character was on trial rather than the allegations at hand. It's a defense attorney's job to pull this bullshit out of his ass, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. But it's also just wild because like having witnesses that testify to a pattern of behavior is very common in these cases. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it's just because especially in sexual assault cases where it's a he said, she said, but then you have five other she's saying like, yeah, it also happened to me. Like it's very common to use that. Like, especially in instances where um, like statute of limitations may have run out. So like those women cannot press charges, but you can establish a pattern of behavior that gives more weight to the she said in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just very, heartbreaking for those victims and i mean who knows if he's gonna go on trial again and like what is to come and like how um, do you even find an unbiased jury at this point when yeah. everyone knows it and 
Exactly. I also saw when I was looking this up, apparently he got transferred to Rikers Island awaiting his yeah. new trial, which I was like, after we did a deep dive on that place, I cannot imagine that old man being there. But um, yeah. supposedly due to the tran- the transferring of from prison, I guess, to jail, um, he got really sick and is now in the hospital and apparently is just really bad health wise. I mean, so yeah. maybe he won't even make it to the next trial. That's true. Or That's maybe true. this is all just him being like, I'm so sick. So he doesn't have to stay in Rikers Island. Mm, yeah, another uh I'm trying to think of the Golden State Killer's actual name in my mind is going blank. Uh, um D'Angelo Joseph D'Angelo. He, yes, Joseph D'Angelo, yes. Um another one of his, you know, oh, I'm just this weak, frail old man. And yeah, you know, and he's not. He's just a piece of shit. So mm-hmm. All right, so we're going to get into today's episode. Um, Our sources included an episode of 1990s, The Deadliest Decade, where I wrote season and left it blank. So, you know, figure it out, I guess. Um, If you Google this guy's name and that show, you'll find it. So (laughs) you're welcome for that. Um, Also, an Oxygen.com article, um, a couple of New York Times articles, and this is from Newsweek, and it's kind of... It's like a journalist who has been very involved with someone in this case. We'll we'll talk about that in a little bit, but usually Newsweek is kind of more, eh, so I just wanted to clarify Mm. why it was in here. So. So the murder of a New York City public school teacher shook the community, but when more information came to light about his upbringing, many wondered about possible motives. So Jonathan Levin grew up in Manhasset, Long Island, about 30 minutes away from New York City. Um, He was a popular guy with an upper middle class family. And when his parents divorced, he was raised by his mother. Um, Jonathan was very into rap. He liked writing his own lyrics. And after graduating college, he moved to an apartment on the Upper West Side in New York City when he was 22 years old. He was a big Yankees fan and friends described him as a gentle soul. And after college, he worked for a while at an insurance company, but he just wasn't really like satisfied with that career path. Um, He felt that like business and like the money world, Wall Street, like really took advantage of people, which obviously Mm -hmm. they do. (laughs) Um, And so he's like, I just want to do something like more meaningful with my life. Like this whole like just making money and this really isn't for me. So he enrolled in a master's of education program at NYU and his professors there described him as very outgoing, that he was like kind of always slightly in a rush. Like he was just on the go, like always doing stuff, always wanting to do more stuff, learning more stuff. Um, Jonathan really liked literature and reading and writing. So he decided to teach English. In 1993, Jonathan took a job teaching English at William H. Taft High School in the Bronx. Um, And at this time, crime was going down pretty much everywhere in New York City, except the Bronx. Like the Bronx was still um, had a very high crime rate at that time. It was a pretty rough area. And his friends thought that like maybe he was a little naive about what he was getting into. Like let's say he did have this like upper middle class, you know, upbringing. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, like you're going to go like teach high school in the Bronx. Like, do you really know what uh, what you're doing? Um, The Bronx schools had metal detectors because students were bringing, like, knives and screwdrivers to school, not with the intention of harming others, but so they could protect themselves because the gang violence was just, like, so bad. They're, like, sneaking these things into school so that they can be safe if needed. So Jonathan really wanted to help these kids, but he did know he needed to gain their respect first. Um, He was a white teacher in a predominantly black school, and he knew that many students might not trust him. He also understood, like, the background of what these kids were going through and the impact that low employment, drug culture, broken homes was having on these kids and their behavior. So he's like, I understand they're not bad kids. Like, they're not, Mm -hmm. you know, they've been through a lot and that's resulting in the behaviors that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So he ditched traditional school rules and he tried to relate the literature he was teaching to his students' lives. Um, He was very down to earth and he wanted to connect to the students on their level. And he also used his love of rap in his classroom to teach literature. So did this inspire that um, Hilary Swank movie, Freedom Writers? Because this sounds like the plot of Freedom Writers so far. I don't know. (laughs) Have you not seen that movie? I have, but it's been a long time. I can't remember all of the details. I mean, it's kind of the same thing where it's like Hilary Swank, like the white teacher Mm -hmm. and like the predominantly like black classroom where a lot of, you know, the kids are exposed to like gang violence Mm -hmm. and all of that. And so she tries to like 
make the classroom like more yeah their style where they can like relate and stuff yeah i mean definitely could be so 16 year old Corey arthur was a student at william h taft and he was just constantly getting in trouble he rarely went to class but one day he decided to go to jonathan's class um, and when he got there he saw a quote from rapper krs1 on the board and this got his attention he's like okay like i'll give it a try today so he sat down and he finished class um, so Jonathan really connected with Corey after that and encouraged him to come to class more and was just really invested in him. Um, Corey did eventually go to prison for selling drugs like later that school year. Um, but after he got out, like he got his GED and Jonathan tried to help him get into the Bronx Community College. Um, so this was someone that Jonathan just really believed in and like was one of the few dependable and Jonathan was one of the few dependable people in Corey's life. Um, Corey was even the subject of a paper Jonathan wrote for his master's degree. On May 31st, 1997, 31-year-old Jonathan Levin was supposed to be at school for a Saturday morning mentoring program, but he never showed up. Um, as we've made very clear, he loved his work, he loved his students, was not like him at all to not show up. So some of the other teachers tried to get a hold of him, but he didn't answer his phone all weekend. When Monday morning arrived, Jonathan never showed up for school. So the principal reached out to some of the teachers who hung out with him. They continued, like, calling him and checking on him. And then Monday night, a group of them went to his apartment with the police to check on him. So they tried knocking and no one answered. Um, then they asked his next-door neighbor, Richard, if he'd seen Jonathan, and he said he hadn't seen him all weekend. He did have a spare key, so he offered to go into the apartment first to secure Jonathan's dog um, because the two would go on walks together often, like, with the dog. So he's like, I know the dog. I can go in and kind of, you know, get him out of your way um, because he knows me. But as soon as they opened the door, Richard smelled something really bad. And so he stepped back and let the police enter. So when they entered the apartment, they saw Jonathan lying face down between the kitchen and the living room. The room was a mess, like drawers were open everywhere. Um, Jonathan's ankles had been bound with duct tape. And the medical examiner determined that he was killed by a gunshot wound behind the right ear, but he also had like knife wounds all over him. Um, it was clear that Jonathan's death had not been quick. Um, a roll of duct tape was left out and police believed it was the tape the killer used to tie him up. And they were able to lift fingerprints from the tape. Jonathan's wallet was out and his credit cards were still inside, but there was no ATM card. So they're wondering if this could be a possible motive if someone has his ATM card. His answering machine was full of messages from the other teachers and friends trying to reach him. Um, and at this time, a homicide in the Upper West Side was very big news. So the same homicide had happened, you know, a few blocks over. It would not have made headlines, but at this mm -hmm. time it definitely did because of where he lived. There were multiple cigarette butts in the ashtray and what looked like Chinese food for two people that were kind of like left out. So investigators did believe that Jonathan knew his killer and had just been enjoying their company before his death. There were also no signs of forced entry um, and someone would have had to buzz any visitors into the building. So again, another indicator that Jonathan likely knew his killer. Um, investigators asked neighbors if they saw or heard anything. and His downstairs neighbor reported hearing Jonathan's dog pacing and the TV playing all weekend. An employee at the deli below Jonathan's apartment reported that she made him a sandwich on Saturday. Um, she said he was in there often, so she definitely recognized him. Um, Jonathan was supposedly dating, like, a couple of women, one of whom was married, so investigators wondered if a jealous husband could have murdered him. Cleo Tejada said they had been dating since the previous year and had been on vacations together and, like, casually discussed marriage. Cleo was still married, but had been separated from her husband for about three years. She did say her husband confronted Jonathan about their relationship the month before his murder, but investigators were able to find out that Cleo's husband had been with another woman at the time of Jonathan's murder, so he didn't seem like a very possible suspect. And on June 3rd, students at the high school were informed of Jonathan's death, and many of them were just devastated. Um, some students were so distressed they had to be taken to the hospital because they just like could not cope with this news. Mm-hmm. So the media soon revealed that Jonathan was the son of Gerald Levin, who was the CEO of Time Warner Cable. So he was a very, very wealthy and powerful man. Um, he was the president of one of the largest companies in the country. Um, and while Jonathan's childhood was upper middle class and very comfortable, his father made his fortune after his parents divorced. Um, and Jonathan had never, like, taken money from his father. He also didn't try to use, like, any of his business connections to his advantage, like, even when he was working in insurance. So... You know, he obviously, like, had this very, very wealthy father, but wasn't, like, as involved with him as 
It was kind of yeah, made out to be. Had, he had like a backup plan. Like yeah. if things went bad, he had somewhere to fall, but he wasn't mm-hmm. exactly like trying to be a Nepo baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this information was news to investigators, but his students were not surprised because Jonathan had revealed who his father was during an autobiography project in his class earlier that school year. So some of the students did know this about him. Mm. Um, And at the time, they did wonder, like, why the son of a millionaire was teaching high school English in the Bronx. So, like, what are you doing here? Yeah. And Jonathan's funeral was packed, and it was an odd assortment of mourners, as there were many students from William H. Taft, but there were also celebrities and high-profile business people who knew Jonathan's father. So a very large assortment of people. And investigators started moving away from the jealous husband theory and started wondering if Jonathan's murder had to do with his father's wealth. Um, At the same time, FBI agents in Chicago we're on the hunt for Andrew Cunanan, who is a serial killer on the FBI's most wanted list. Um, so Andrew was gay and was known for murdering his lovers, and he often targeted wealthy men. Um, and he also frequently used duct tape on his victims. So we kind of have two possible things in here that are in his M.O. Mm-hmm. Um, there had been rumors that Jonathan was gay, so investigators were wondering maybe if he was dating Cunanan. So Cunanan had also been linked to another murder in New Jersey that was only 120 miles away. So it is possible he could have been like in the area. Um, however, investigators were never never able to find any connection between Jonathan and Andrew. And Andrew Cunanan uh, murdered fashion designer Gianni Versace later that summer. Um, so that's probably why you've heard that name um, and then died by suicide. So investigate. Investigators finally got a break in the case when they discovered Jonathan's ATM card had been used at a bank two blocks away from his apartment at 5.15 p.m. the day he was murdered. So surveillance footage showed that it wasn't Jonathan using the ATM card, but it wasn't clear enough to identify who the person was. So the person withdrew $800 in two separate transactions. And investigators went back to the messages on Jonathan's answering machine to see if anything stood out. Like, is someone calling that's kind of weird? Is someone not calling... I don't know what's going on here. So one message was some from someone who identified himself as Corey and called him Mr. Levin. Um, he said he needed to see him right away and had something really, really important to tell him. Um, they believe the caller was either a current or former student because he called him Mr. Levin. Um, and they were able to trace the call to a payphone two blocks from Jonathan's apartment. So investigators went to the high school to see if they could find a Corey, but there were no current students there named Corey. And other students did say that Jonathan didn't have boundaries with students and that he would often check on them. And it wouldn't be unusual for a student to call him at home and ask to see him. Like, that's very common that he would just, you know, open his heart to his students and let Mm -hmm. them call him, talk to him at any time. And like everyone said, like he would never like do anything inappropriate with them. Like it wasn't that Mm -hmm. way of like not having boundaries. It was just like, I'm always here for you. Like I will always, you know, here's my personal phone number. Here's my personal address. Like I'm here for whatever you need. Like just, I mean, he just really cared about the students and wanted to do whatever he could for them. So like, yeah, like it wouldn't be unusual for a student to call him at home and say like, I need to see you. Which is so sad because it's probably like the teacher, like so many of these students need. Mm -hmm. And then he got murdered way too young. Like, exactly. It's really sad. Yeah. So it didn't take long for the fingerprints on the duct tape inside Jonathan's apartment to come back. So once the fingerprints were entered, they did match up with three arrests for drug possession. um, And they did match up to 19 year old Corey Arthur, Um, the student Jonathan believed in who was like the subject of an essay for his master's thesis in 1993. So again, we talked about Corey a little bit earlier and like it did match up with him. So an $11,000 reward was put out for Corey's capture, but he was on the run. So police raided several locations after tips from people who knew Corey and they were always a step behind and would arrive somewhere just after Corey left. And at one house, they recovered some of Corey's clothing that was covered in blood. So Corey's ex-girlfriend told police that another man was involved, 25-year-old Montoon Hart. Um, He and Corey knew each other from their neighborhood, but didn't really appear to be friends. Uh, Montoon was arrested, and he confessed to being at Jonathan's apartment with Corey, but said he wasn't the one who killed him. 
He said Corey had the gun and knife and he had Montoon get the duct tape. So Montoon said Corey was cruel and Jonathan was pleading for his life and asking him why he was doing this. And Corey said they couldn't keep him alive because he would identify them and they would go to jail. So Montoon said the robbery was Corey's idea and Corey told him Jonathan, quote, had cr- access to crazy money because they knew who his father was. So mm-hmm. kind of lining up with a motive here. Yeah. So on June 7th, detectives tracked Corey down to his grandmother's house in the Bedford Stye projects after a tip from an ex-girlfriend. Um, the ex-girlfriend said Corey confessed to the murder and was planning to head to North Carolina soon. So police arrested him and he was charged with first degree murder and robbery and Montoon Hart was charged with second degree murder and robbery in the second degree. So Corey's statement was that he went to see Jonathan on his own and that Montoon wasn't with him. Um, He said he was there because he would smoke crack cocaine with Jonathan, but Jonathan's toxicology report didn't show any drugs and I'm sure his friends would know. I mean, crack cocaine's not really a casual one that you can kind of hide. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Not being like, oh, I didn't know he would smoke weed occasionally. Like, no, this is (laughs) crack cocaine. A little little different. Yeah. So Corey claimed men burst into the apartment and forced him to tie Jonathan up. And that's why his fingerprints were on the duct tape. Corey said he tied Jonathan up and then fled the apartment, so he didn't even know Jonathan died until later. Um, Corey refused to name any names of the assailants and said he didn't come forward at the time because he was afraid he would be accused. Okay. <laughs> so, Corey Arthur I mean, went... yeah, that's, that's I mean, kind of how that would go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you fled. You didn't call 911. You didn't... Yeah. It might happen. So Corey Arthur went to trial for the murder of Jonathan Levin in October of 1998, and the prosecution called 70 witnesses. Um, Corey was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. And during his sentencing hearing, Jonathan's mom, Carol Levin, made a statement to Corey that he took advantage of the one person who cared for him, which she's not really wrong. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, she's like this one person, like, was so kind to you and was like, pushing you and trying to like help you and this is what you did to him yeah and montoon hart went to trial in january of 1999 and his defense said his confession was unreliable because he was drunk when he gave it um there was no physical evidence tying montoon to jonathan's apartment and Corey had stated that montoon wasn't there so montoon was actually acquitted Corey Arthur was raised by his mother and great-grandmother and had a half-brother and a half-sister. He did like school during his elementary school years, but trouble began in middle school, and his first encounter with the police was at 12 years old when he and some friends skipped school. In the summer of 1992, he was arrested for trying to set a subway clerk's booth on fire, and he got kicked out of his high school in Brooklyn, and that's when he started attending William H. Taft High School in the Bronx. Um, Everyone who knew him believed he thought very highly of Jonathan Levin and their relationship. You know, again, Jonathan was helping him try to go to community college. Like, Mm -hmm. Jonathan wrote about him in, like, his thesis. Like, seemed like they had a very good relationship. Yeah. So, Corey remains in a New York state prison today. He has still never provided details of what happened the day Jonathan died, but he says he is responsible for Jonathan's death. He claims that he told Jonathan's family that he was always has always been willing to discuss what happened directly with them if they want to know. I guess he's like, I won't tell everyone, but like I'll tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, and he claims that Jonathan was alive when he last saw him, but insinuates that he was engaging in activities with Jonathan or had introduced Jonathan to other individuals that ended in his murder. Five years after Jonathan's murder, the New York City Education Department opened Jonathan Levin High School for Media and Communications in the same building where he had taught high school. Um, for the first five years, attendance was 90%, and almost $750,000 came in to support the school, and the media program was thriving. In 2005, Jonathan's mom, Carol, took a job teaching at the Bronx High School of Business in the same building where her son worked. Um, unfortunately, scholarship scholarship money started to kind of like dry up, and graduation rates plummeted to 31%. And the school officially closed in June of 2016, which is really sad. Yeah, it is really sad. 
And that is just the really sad and tragic murder of Jonathan Levin. Yeah, like it's just the one person that like truly cared about you and was like trying to help you make a difference in your life. And and I get, I'm just so like, I don't know. I want to know like what really happened. Like was it Montoon's story that it was just mm -hmm. a robbery and that he was like, well, we, he can't know who it was. Um, but like Montoon was acquitted because Corey said he was never there. So why would... I don't know. It's a very I mean, unless weird... Corey was like tied up in some really, really bad shit and yeah. then because I mean he left the voicemail saying I have something really, really important to tell you. Like maybe he was like owed people money or something mm -hmm. was happening. And so he was like, I can go to this guy, he can get me some money, he'll help me yeah. out. Like maybe like I think Corey was probably I mean, his fingerprints were on the duct tape. Like maybe he mm -hmm. was there, but maybe he didn't yeah give the final you know gunshot wound like mm -hmm. i don't know i mean it sounds like whatever it was he is responsible and led himself montoon whoever murdered him to that apartment that's what's weird to me is like if something else like didn't happen like if it was just a case of he went in he murdered jonathan like why would he say like oh i didn't do it but i am responsible for his death like i deserve mm -hmm. to be in prison like why would you accept like that part of it but unless you just like are truly disassociating from the event and like i can't admit what i did so i'm gonna say that i accept responsibility but i also can't admit what i actually did to this person so so that kind of makes me think that maybe it was a, a situation like that where like he led other people to jonathan or mm -hmm. you know whatever the case and may i mean be. maybe montoon was involved in something and he like because how would Montoon know all of this information mm -hmm. that seemingly lines up? Yeah. But then Corey's saying he's not there. Like, is he protecting him because of something else? Mm, you know? Yeah, and like, it could, be. it could be disassociation. Or is he saying like, I'm responsible, but like he was alive when I left. Like, did he lead other people to him? So he is mm -hmm. responsible, but like, yeah, it's hard to know. Also, at the beginning, when I mentioned that Newsweek article, so that was a journalist who has, like, visited Corey in prison, like, many, many times. Um, so that's where I got some of, like, the background information, like, about Corey. Mm -hmm. um, and he he kind of has some of the same thoughts about, like, okay, like, was there something more to this? And he's like, he doesn't, like, this guy doesn't seem like a murderer, which, I mean, lots of people don't. Like, I don't think that's a, a valid excuse. A valid, Especially, yeah. I mean, he he was 19 years old at the time. Like, he, you know, I, I don't think you can claim now like oh this person doesn't seem like he did it and that's that but uh he did mention too like oh like did the police like not look at anything else but it's like i mean you had the guy's fingerprints you they obviously like had a connection they knew each other he left him a voicemail saying he was coming over like you have him in the apartment but as far as i can find there was never any like they never found the gun um they never found like the knife they never found anything other than the duct tape that like tied him mm -hmm. to the actual death so like we know Corey was there but like like you said could other people have been involved as well but like the police like once they got the information on Corey, it's like well this is it done we don't need to look into it any further especially when you also have montoon's confession which of course he ended up getting acquitted mm -hmm. but they didn't know that at the time of the investigation but i don't know it's just it's odd yeah yeah but it again, feels like very very sad there's a missing piece Mm -hmm. somewhere like there's something missing yeah because you're just like why like not that it ever makes sense but it's just like this one person who like cares so deeply for you that you seem mm -hmm. to have this great relationship with like why it doesn't it doesn't yeah. add up so have you ever heard of the movie 187 mm -mm. okay so it has samuel l jackson and it came out in like around this time it was like 1990 Seven. Yes, 1997. Um, but it's basically like a high school teacher in New York City um, is like stabbed nine times by a student and then mm -hmm. like ends up going to like L.A. as like a substitute teacher. And so I, don't, I haven't seen the movie. I just like read the little like synopsis or whatever. Um, but that movie was like slated to come out like right after Jonathan's murder and Jonathan's father was the CEO of Time Warner Cable which did you know is the same company as Warner Brothers 
I did not realize did they were the that. same wars. Okay. I did know that. I didn't know that. I only knew because of like the down the road. Like, I think it was like a merger type thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, so, but basically, like I read this article talking about how like this movie got like no press because they're like, we can't promote this movie of a high school teacher getting stabbed in New York City by a student right, right after, after our CEO's <laughs> son was murdered by a student yeah. <laughs> like it was like this weird because like obviously the movie was already like filmed and in production and like all this stuff but like then that happened like when they're supposed to be like promoting it and like everything that I, like it has yeah. really bad reviews like it just seems like a very like what's not well-known movie and so I wonder how much of that had to do with this um but I just thought that was very interesting because it's like yeah how are you gonna sit there right after his son's yeah. murder and like promote this movie that's eerily similar that's crazy yeah yeah, that's just the horrific, senseless murder of Jonathan Levin. So that being said, Courtney, what is your perk of the week? Okay, my perk of the week is almost like a Jacqueline perk of the week, what I'm about to say. Um, and basically, it's the fact that about a month ago, Kevin's parents came into town and we went to this restaurant. And I got this. I was like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, where is this going? It's probably food related. <laughs> yeah. And I got this like black and blue salad, which is like mm-hmm. steak, blue cheese, salad, whatever. And it was so good. I loved it. And I've been thinking about it ever since. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to try to make it at home. Mm-hmm. And I had low expectations because I was like, it's not going to be as good. It's never mm-hmm. going to be as good as like this restaurant. But I made it last night, guys. And it was <laughs> incredible. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure Kevin was sick of me because I kept being like, this is so good. Like, this <laughs> You're is like, so I did such a great job on this. <laughs> so good. It was just everything I wanted because you had like you had the lettuce and the cucumber and the red bell pepper that were like fresh. And then you mm-hmm. have like the blue cheese and the ranch. And then you had, you know, like the steak, which was like more savory. But then you could have like a refreshing bite. And I put some balsamic vinaigrette on it and mm. just made it. Oh. It was so good. And I already put it on my menu for next week. I'm making <laughs> like, it This again. is a, a new staple. Here we go. <laughs> I know. I asked Kevin. I was like, will you be mad if <laughs> I make it again next week? Because it was I just, it. it was so good. And you know, like whenever you try, whenever you're like trying to save money and not eat out all the time mm-hmm. and you try to like recreate a meal and you're like, I mean, it's good. It's just not it, you know, yeah. like it's missing that it thing like it's still good like you're still gonna enjoy it but you'd rather you know you can make burgers at home but you want to go to a bridge and get their Mm -hmm. burger it's not as good Mm -hmm. at home exactly they know what they're doing (laughs) (laughs) so when you do perfect it it's just like oh look this like yeah like i told kevin i was like i critique everything i cook like everything i'm like "Ah, i could have had a little bit of this oh i should have had it like whatever everything Mm -hmm. i cook this i was like no notes perfection (laughs) i'm good perfect so that's I was just very proud of that. And it was just, it was so good. Was so good. <laughs> so this is your that's... sign. If you have been scared to try to make something that you loved at home, just try it. It'll probably be good. And last time we talked about how I made the jalapeno dip and it turned out good. So see, yeah. look, it's just full circle moment. Yeah. Love it. But um, that's very exciting. It was so good. I'm trying another new recipe this week. I mean, I'm trying all these new recipes. I don't know what's gone into me. I'm nervous, but (laughs) we'll see how it goes. (laughs) Um, Um, Speaking of recipes, I got to tell you what my child did tonight. So Andrew made pasta. So he did, I think it was like a macaroni type noodle and Italian sausage and zucchini and like a marinara sauce. So we eat this Mm -hmm. pretty frequently. So Millie's sitting there like, picking through her food and like she's in like an anti-onion phase so she can like see onions like she's not going to eat it so i don't know if mm-hmm. she's like looking for them to be because like and andrew's like i cut those things up like so fine like she's never going to see them in there so he's like she's like picking through she went through and she ate every single bite of pasta and then every single bite of meat and then every single bite of zucchini it, it's literally all mixed in together and she like finger she, like, picked, separated them one by one ate every single noodle and then ate every chunk of meat and then ate all of the zucchini. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's so weird. It was very weird. <laughs> I don't know what. You know, if she's eating, like, I'm not questioning it. Like, you do your thing. Like, I'm not yeah, going like, to, like, comment on it. But I'm just like, what? Strange. You know, because, yeah. like, personally, I like, as long as I like everything there, mm-hmm. I like to eat where I have, like, a bite of each. Left, Absolutely. You know? 
and you get down to that perfect bite. So you like make sure you save one mm-hmm. of like each little thing. So like the last bite is like, yeah. Anyway, I just had to share that. <laughs> but that is my perk of the week is my black and blue steak salad that I'm going to be making <laughs> probably until I'm sick of it. Um, That's how do it. What is your perk of the week? Um, so my perk of the week is that my birthday was this past weekend. Um, so we had a big party. I'm mean, going to say party. Just a bunch of people came over. We had food, you know. Um, but we had like family and friends. And Andrew made some delicious hibachi, which like was just... Mm -hmm. It was so good. It was really good. Like he did steak and shrimp and chicken and like all the veggies and it just turned out fantastic. Um, So yeah, so it was just a great time just getting to hang out with all of my people and the kids got to run around and play and we got to eat some delicious food and have some brownies and just enjoy everyone's company and the weather was nice and it was just, it was just a delightful little birthday, you know? Yeah. (laughs) A little birthday. <laughs> Delightful little birthday. And mostly just some delicious food that we did not have as much leftover as I was hoping because I always loved those leftovers. I was like, oh, man, like everyone else loved it, too. <laughs> yeah, I was also wondering because the last time you guys did like a hibachi night, you had like, no lie, like six containers yes. of like combined leftovers left. So I was like, <laughs> wonder how much they're going to have left this time. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, and we always cook too much food because, you know, you just always want to make sure like, okay, everybody has enough. Mm-hmm. So, like we always have too much. And this time I was like, oh no, like we pretty much made like, r- like we had, right we out. had it for one night, um, Sunday night for dinner. We had, all three of us had leftovers and then, um, there was enough for like two people to have leftovers for lunch today. And that was it. <laughs> like it yeah. was like, and Andrew had to make more vegetables because all the vegetables were gone. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but no, everyone else seemed to like it too. So that's always a good sign to the, to the chef when everyone goes back for seconds or thirds mm-hmm. in Sam's case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm always a seconds person. Like I yeah. will make my first plate smaller sometimes so that I can go back and get seconds. And I don't know what the mindset is behind it. Like, I don't know why, but it's like, yeah. I love going back for more. And yeah. so I just like, I'm like, okay, I'll you give know, myself a little less. So th- and like, Kevin think... is never a seconds person. Like Kevin eats his food and then he's done. Oh, Me, that's interesting. But he also, you know, just likes to eat food to live. <laughs> That's so, true. He's not a, but a... me, you know, he really likes it if he goes for seconds. Like, if he goes for <laughs> seconds, you're like, oh, he loves that, this meal. That was like with Sam. Andrew's like, I've never seen Sam eat this much food in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but he's also just person. a food to eat person. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm a seconds eat... person. Like, what? I'd rather have a smaller first plate to get seconds. Sorry, I just realized my food, my my words made no sense. <laughs> I said a food to eat person, and I was like, that doesn't make food sense. Food to eat person. And, but you were like, yeah, like you know what I meant. But no, okay, so I think what, you, it's like, okay, it's like with children, because I say like, don't like, if you put too much food on their plate, like it's overwhelming and they won't eat anything. Yeah. But if you give them like one bite at a time, like they'll eat a bunch of food. Because it's So I think maybe you just get overwhelmed when it's like a That's full true. plate of food. So you're like, oh, I like to just have like the small plate and then go back and get another plate, you know? Yeah. I like to, <laughs> I just like the act of like going back and getting more. I don't know, maybe not, it's not even like Courtney. a scarcity mindset. I've never like starved in my life like my parents always made sure I had food like (laughs) for lunch and dinner it's not like but it's almost like I like I want more I have a thought though Mm -hmm. because I know you like your hot food hot so is it because the leftovers are like still sitting on the stove so when you go back and get seconds (gasps) it's like hot and fresh it could be versus like if you just have one big plate more that when i go back and like the thing that was in the crock pot i get it again and it's like piping hot again yeah it could be that it could be i think i solved it i think i solved it too yeah okay well if you guys want to tell us about your delicious foods and if you like it do you always eat seconds do you sometimes eat seconds do you never eat seconds like what's your you know let us know um let us know your thoughts on this case. Have you ever heard of and or seen the movie 187? Um, let us know your thoughts about that. Maybe we'll watch it sometime. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know where to do that on all of the things that are in the show notes. We are also on patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes where we have a bunch of bonus episodes. We have our Discord chat. We have pins and stickers, and here in a few weeks, you will have a bonus episode all about CrimeCon. So if you want mm-hmm. to hear 
the ins and outs of that. If you want the episode recorded from the bed, that's going to be the one. So, you know, mm-hmm. come join us, listen to it. Um, maybe we'll do like a live stream one night. That'd be fun for a little bit. That would bit, be fun. You know? Like we could get on Instagram live. Yeah. See if anyone joins us. It would be embarrassing <laughs> if nobody joins us. Well, that's probably what's going to happen. If you're listening to this, mark your calendar so that while we're at CrimeCon, mm-hmm. just pay attention to your Instagram app. And if it says we go live, go hang out with us for a minute, you know, and we'll yeah. chat about what we're doing. So... And that's for everybody, not just Patreon, but again, patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes if you want all of that other stuff that we mentioned. Yeah. Um, and if you wouldn't mind to please give us five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcast, anywhere that has a rating system. And we're also on YouTube if you want to like and subscribe over there. Um, but in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. <laughs>